episode four of Money Revealed. As you can see, there's certainly a lot of information here and there's a lot more to learn, but of course it's worth our time. Why? Because this is about your money. It's about your financial future. It's about your security. All those things are very important. And I want you to know that we all learn a little bit differently. So when you own Money Revealed, it will include transcripts so you can read, it will include audio so you can listen, as well as the videos and many other bonuses. So check out the packages that we have, pick out the one that's right for you and own this information. And as you're considering that, I want to invite you now to jump into episode four with me and let's learn more. I'm a great admirer of Mike Dillard. I've read his newsletters for a long time, and he's someone who is greatly admired in the entrepreneurial world. We were excited to go to Austin to sit down with him and gain insight and wisdom from him. And he's just got a style and a delivery and a way of communication that is extremely powerful and compelling, but also it's just no hype. What you see is what you get. There's great insight here, and it's something that I'm very excited to bring to you. Enjoy my interview with Mike Dillard. Mike, you have such a great reputation. I've really been looking forward to this conversation, so uh, thanks for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. Looking forward to it. So let's talk about uh, maybe just your entrepreneurial journey and background. How did you get started in being an entrepreneur? Oh, gosh, that goes back to my days in high school mm -hmm. and waiting tables at the original Macaroni Grill in Berlin, oh, wow. Texas. Yeah, uh -huh. which was the same building as the original Rudy's Barbecue. And I used to mountain bike race competitively and... I needed money to fund that, so I'd, I'd bus tables uh, at night during school. Mm -hmm. And I really earned an appreciation for the lack of freedom that comes with having a job. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that I'd miss out on a lot of good times with, with friends on the weekends. And I'd come home at you know, 11, 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, exhausted, smelling like food, and would head back home to my parents' house, turn on television at uh, that late at night. And there's really only one thing on at 1 a.m. back in those days, which was infomercials. Uh -huh. <laughs> so watching Tony Robbins and Carlton Sheets and all of those guys, right. and that really just exposed me to the fact that there was other options available and options without limitations, which really appealed to me. So it was a natural fit, but that was the inspiration and started playing with uh, you know, starting little businesses way back in high school and college, and that's where I got my start. What did you study in college? Uh, <laughs> first semester was biology. Yeah. I was going to be a dentist because at the time my uncle was the most successful, wealthiest person in our family tree. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, if I have no other, other interests, that seems like the smartest thing to do. Uh, immediately found out what beer was <laughs> when I showed up to the dorm because I never drank in high school since I was cycling. And my first semester, I got a 1-3. Um, so immediately changed, changed plans and I went to summer school on probation, switched over to marketing, and did well there. But uh, I honestly never went to class. I went to Barnes & Noble. And I'd sit in the business section reading books on the floor, skipped all of my classes, and then I would go pay 50, 60 bucks to go to the cram sessions You know, three days before. You get all the old tests. Great. And that's what I did for five years until I passed with a 2.0. <laughs> and uh, my theory on that was that I went to class as much as I need to and not a minute more. Yeah. Uh, so I already knew I wanted to, to be an entrepreneur, so the degree for me was yeah, kind of pointless. So. What did you do when you got out? So what was your first business venture? First business venture was in the network marketing industry. Mm -hmm. And this is Web 1.0 days. This is early 2000s, 2000, 2001. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, at the time, this is pre-social media, no YouTube, Facebook, pre-MySpace. Uh, but I had a mentor that had been working with me over the phone for about a year named Stu out in California. And I said, Stu, I'm packing up my truck after I graduate a week later, and I'm coming to learn from you until I figure this out. And how did you was, find Stu? I mean, how did he come into your life? Uh, probably through the network marketing business I was in at the time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so that's what I did. I packed up my old Chevy truck with everything I owned from my dorm, said goodbye to the folks, drove to California, got to San Diego where he was, and realized I could not afford anywhere in San Diego. So I kept going to Temecula, mm -hmm. found a $300 a month apartment, uh, had my bed, my desk, and a chair, and that was it. And the living room was full of boxes from my, my memorabilia and college stuff. 
And that was September 10th, 2001. Mm -hmm. So the next morning, wow. I got a phone call from mom, freaking out. And that was, uh, that was a big change in plans because at the time, if you're selling opportunity, if you're selling hope, if you're selling a brighter, better future, and all of a sudden the world changes overnight, that's not really something that people are in the mood to, to talk about at the moment. Right. And so our, our plans at, at that time really took a dive, got a job at Best Buy selling computers there in Temecula mm -hmm. for probably three, four months. Couldn't pay the bills at seven bucks an hour, eight bucks an hour, whatever I was making and eventually headed back home to, to Texas. And it was a, a tough lesson learned, but, but interesting timing. And yeah, so that was the first, uh, that was the first venture. So uh, maybe just as a, uh, now with the uh, reflective wisdom after being through this, the, the role of a mentor in the development of being an entrepreneur and the, and the role of timing where things happen, because you're also mm -hmm. on the heels of the dot-com bubble burst, right? Mm -hmm. So that, that kind of process, then 9-11 happened. So, you know, how, how timing might influence your plans. Timing is interesting because it can, it can throw a wrench in a certain set of plans and it can create opportunities in different ways if mm -hmm. you have the skill sets to capitalize on that. And at the time, I didn't have any skills. Mm -hmm. I was still trying to figure it out. So I don't think at the end of the day, it would have made a difference either way because mm -hmm. uh, I just didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. But it was, I think the determination was the biggest piece of the puzzle. And I really made up my mind at that point that I was going to become an entrepreneur. I was basically going to die trying. Uh, you know, I'd planned when I couldn't make rent or pay my cell phone bill one month. I was like, okay, I can get a gym membership. I can take a shower there. Maybe I can find an air conditioned rental unit and I'll sleep there and then I'll figure it out. And that's where my thinking was going. There wasn't any plan B or, you know, idea of quitting. So, so what's interesting is that, um, a lot of people might've reacted in that circumstance by saying, uh, well, I guess I'm not meant to do this, you know, the way things unfolded, which mm -hmm. you know, the meant to be thing is, I always find that to be a confusing premise. But, uh, but in, in your case, it was like there was, you weren't dissuaded, you know, by the circumstances you were still going to work to go through them. What do you think the compulsion was? I mean, because this is really the heart of an entrepreneur, isn't it? The idea of having a job and giving up on everything I wanted to do in life was infinitely more painful than living in a storage unit. Yeah. Yeah. That was yeah, it. That was it. Just that simple. Yeah. So then what unfolded from there? Gosh, moved back to San Antonio, got a job uh, briefly in Dallas recruiting surgeons. This, the biggest piece of advice I ever got was a mentor in that industry at the time. And I'd gone on for five years and failed, didn't make a dime for five years in a row. And it got to a point where I was like, okay, something's got to change here. And he finally gave me a really good piece of honest advice. And he said, Mike, the reason you're not hitting your financial goals in this industry is because you're not capable of getting the result that you want. You're not that person right now. And you've been chasing these opportunities, if you will. And I put all the responsibility for success on something outside of myself. Mm -hmm. Either it was the business or the product or the marketing materials, but I thought success was going to come as a result of those things. Mm -hmm. And it finally dawned on me when he said that. He said, if you want to go make, let's say, $50,000 a month, because that was my big lifelong dream at the time, mm -hmm. he's like, you have to become a person who's capable of achieving that. And he's like, you're not mm -hmm. right now. You're not. You don't have any mastery of any skill sets whatsoever. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. And it was a big light bulb moment for me. So from that point forward, I dove in headfirst into every book I could find on sales, marketing, lead generation and copywriting specifically. I was very shy at the time. I hated talking to people in person and selling. It was just the scariest thing in the world for me to do, even over the, even over the phone. Right. So I learned how to sell via writing, mm -hmm. via copywriting. And it took me about a year, year and a half of just going into every course I could. And I'd sit down at night uh, and print out successful you know, sales presentations and letters from some of the greats like Dan Kennedy or David Ogilvy and, and guys like that. And I would just rewrite them out by hand. And I did that every night for a year, about a year. And I learned that skill set. And all of a sudden, I was like, man, I can really sell something here. Mm -hmm. And then I taught myself how to use Google AdWords. And now how do I get eyeballs in front of what I've written? Mm -hmm. And that really changed everything. Uh, I applied that skill to my network marketing business at the time, started recruiting people for the first time ever, built a team pretty quickly of about three or 400 people. Mm -hmm. 
and realized I absolutely hated it. <laughs> um, this was like five, six years of pursuing this dream and I finally have it and I figured it out and it was miserable. Uh, it just wasn't a part of my personality being a really introverted person. So that was another big chapter where it's a um, decision point. Do I give up on this dream of building a business in that industry for six, seven years now or, or do I stick with it? And the solution or the answer that I came up with was, what if I could build this business in a way that I really enjoyed? Mm -hmm. And for me, the answer was that, to that was just, how do I get people to call me instead? Mm -hmm. How do I stop chasing people and how do I get them to, to come after me? And there was just a little twist, you know, at the time to doing that, which is providing value. Mm -hmm. If you put out value into the world, surprise, surprise, you help other people, they want to work with you. And, and essentially, there's this whole attraction marketing philosophy that uh, I happened to introduce to that industry at the time. So this was 2004, 2005. And no one in that world had ever heard of that. Mm -hmm. They'd never heard of online lead generation. They'd never heard of building a business online. They'd never heard of attraction marketing. And I ended up writing this little 50-page training manual for my team at the time that kind of talked about those philosophies and strategies. And all of a sudden, I had phone calls from people all over the world saying, hey, can I sell this manual to my team?